Um, look, thank you all so much for coming this evening to this event, which is part of the Good Science Equals Great Business 2018 Australian Festival of Innovation in Singapore and ASEAN, our festival running throughout September. We're absolutely delighted to be working with James Cook University Singapore on this initiative and deeply appreciate its generous support as a science festival platinum sponsor and really right there out of the blocks at the start when we were you know, looking for support for this initiative. So thank you really very, very much. Special thanks in that regard to uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Professor Dale Anderson, who I had a uh, fortunate um, catch up with earlier, uh, Dean of Research, Professor Jean Jerry, uh, JCU Singapore Campus Dean, Professor Abhishek Bhatti, and of course the whole JCU team uh, for all their support. Thanks also uh, Associate Professor Jennifer Cobcroft for moderating today and to all the distinguished uh, panellists for taking part. This evening is the first of several wonderful JCU events over the course of the festival, which will of course include the official opening of the JCU Tropical Futures Research Institute. This is indeed really very exciting stuff. And I um, encourage you all to go down uh, when you're leaving this evening and look at the fantastic display of events which is set up down in the uh, entry area to JCU. It's a wonderful display. Um, I'd also very much like to sponsor uh, our other suite of festival... Oh, sorry, like to acknowledge our other suite of festival sponsors. Joining JCU as a platinum sponsor is the Australian National University. Our gold sponsors are Curtin Singapore, Icon SOC and Lend Lease. And our silver sponsors are Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, Australian Nuclear Science Technology Organisation, the University of Queensland and Murdoch Singapore. During September, there will be around 40 events, I think 41 as, as of today, <laughs> uh, that we are running uh, to help showcase Australian and Singaporean science capability and to highlight the opportunities for collaboration. The Science Festival started this week and culminates in a gala event on the 27th of September when we hope to also welcome Australia's Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, the Honourable Karen Andrews MP, back to Singapore. We had the pleasure of a visit her from last year. But before we do get to the topic of this evening, seafood security, I want to take just a few moments to talk a little bit more about why, we have the initi why we've initiate, initiated this Science Festival. Australia's strengths in science, I think, can sometimes be underappreciated. I've been to a few events this week where we're clearly well known for our furry animals, our beaches, wine, sporting achievements, and hopefully for expressions such as prawn on the barbie, which they can apt for this evening. <laughs> but we felt we really wanted to take uh, an opportunity and to help give some further prominence to Australian innovation and ingenuity. We wanted to highlight Australian science and te technological capability to the region and to take that further again by supporting efforts to translate these successes into economic opportunities as well. There are many excellent examples of course around Australian innovation, ingenuity, amazing things and products such as silicon hydrological contact lenses which account for about half the lenses fitted internationally which is quite incredible, cochlear ear implants, cervical cancer vaccines, black box flight recorders, Wi-Fi, plastic banknotes, and the list goes on. And of course, we have many eminent scientists uh, and we're delighted to have them engaged in our uh, festival as well. Um, I think 15 Nobel laureates are all up for Australia and we're delighted that three of them are engaged in our festival. Professor Brian Schmidt, Professor Barry James Marshall and of course, our homegrown James Cook University Professor Provost Chris Coughlin. So that's tremendous. This science festival aims to build further appreciation for our technolo technologies and our experts, as I said, and to further support engage engagement with Singapore and the wider region. Australia's commitment to science and innovation is already clear. In 2017-18, the Australian government invested over 10 billion in science, research and innovation, with an additional commitment of $2.4 billion this year. And the stats do already tell a story of growing collaboration. Australia was, uh, Singapore rather, was Australia's 18th highest co-publication partner over 2012-2016. So our next step is to work with Singapore and the region to capitalise on our complementarity in science strengths and to translate those into opportunities for Australia, Singapore and our Southeast Asia region. So this science festival kicks off that process. Thank you all for coming 
and have a great evening. Enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. We really appreciate you coming to give the opening this evening. So uh, just a little reminder to log into Slido if you haven't done that already and also to put your phones to silent before we get started. So I would like to introduce all of our panellists. I can't do them all justice because we don't have enough time, but if you do have time to read through their biographies online, please do because we've got a great lineup this evening. So starting off, we'll have Professor Dean Jerry, who is the Dean of Research at the Singapore campus of James Cook University. He's also the Director of the ARC Research Hub for Advanced Prawn Breeding and the Deputy Director of the JCU Centre for, Tropical, for Sustainable Tropical Fisheries and Aquaculture. His primary area of research focus and expertise is in the application of genetic technologies to the improvement of farmed aquatic organisms. Uh, after Dean, we have Mr. Huan San Lim from the ABA. So he is the Director of the Aquaculture Technology Department under the Agri-Food and Veterinary Authority of Singapore. His department supports the local aquaculture industry through technology transfer, sharing of expertise, R&D collaboration and development of in innovative farming technologies. Mr. Tony Ems is the managing partner of Agribusiness Connect Asia, servicing clients in the agriculture, aquaculture, fishery, food and drink industries. Tony is a strategy and business development consultant who has been living and working in Asia on a permanent basis since 1985. He's a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales and a member of the Singapore Institute of Directors. In 2013, Tony managed a detailed study of the inve investment environment and investor risk in the aquaculture industry in ASEAN. This led to a presentation at a major FAO conference on the dysfunctional nature of wild capture and aquaculture industry development in Asia. After that, we have Mr. Shro Ko, uh, and he is the CEO of Responsible Seafood based in Singapore. He trained in fisheries and aquaculture in Australia and has applied experience in fish hatchery and aquaculture production. He combines science and business to deliver on global projects with a focus on selecting sustainably produced seafood, both wild caught and aquaculture produced for supply to customers in Asia. Uh, then we have Mr. Andrew Kwan, and he is the Group Managing Director of Commonwealth Capital Group of Companies, which has investments across the food industry, including aquaculture, cold chain logistics, centralized kitchen, butchery, bakery, and ice cream production. Sounds great. <laughs> so uh, recently the group launched its transformational and disruptive for, for, farm to fork fish fillets, uh, which has seen its Singapore sea farmed barramundi being air flown to major cities around the world. And finally, we will finish with Professor Andreas Lapata, who we can see on the big screen. So Professor Lapata is a molecular immunologist and professorial chair with the College of Public Health, Medical and Veterinary Sciences at James Cook University. And he is the theme leader of molecular immunology within the Center for Biodiscovery and Molecular Development of Therapeutics. Say that in a hurry. So he leads the Molecular Allergy Research Laboratory uh, in the Australian Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine. His lab has investigated over 160 seafood species for allergens, so that's human allergens, and developed sensitive detection tools for ma the major seafood allergens in highly processed food. So he's looking after us. So uh, we welcome all of our panellists and really look forward to what they're going to share with us this evening. I'll put... Uh, oh, no, we won't do that. Uh, so over to Dean Jerry to start us off. Thank you, Jennifer, and good evening, everyone. Well, I've got the easy task of introducing aquatic food security and what it means. And have I got a clicker? Yep. Uh, I'm sure you all are probably aware of the, the food challenge ahead of humanity into the near f future. You probably are aware that by 2050, there'll be over 9 billion people on this planet 
And for us to feed those people, we actually have to industrialise our food production systems, not just seafood systems, by about 70%. When we overlay this dramatic need to increase our food production systems to feed the human population, we also have this uh, phenomenon of a very rapid rise in middle class, particularly here in Asia where people are becoming more affluent and as they become more wealthy and affluent, they change their diet and substitute their diet away from carbohydrate-based grain diets towards animal protein diets. Now, we all are probably also aware that seafood is a very highly traded commodity. It contributes substantially to food security on the planet and it is not immune from having to upscale itself by 2050. And in actual fact, we currently produce around 150 million tonnes of seafood globally. By 2050, we have to increase this to 240 million tonnes. So this graphic here, I think, illustrates what is happening in terms of, of aquatic food security. So it shows the... A uh, rise in human population, which is represented, I believe, in the, the orange line, where in 1950, and there's probably some people here who were born about that time, so within the age of, of uh, you know, some people, we've gone from a population of about 2 billion people to in 2018 having about 7 billion people. Associated with this, the per capita consumption of seafood has gone from somewhere between 7 kilograms per person to 20 kilograms per people, person. So there's more people and people are eating more seafood. You can also see by the, the bars on the graph is that our seafood production systems actually have been responding to this increased demand to seafood. And we have gone from a situation in 1950 of about uh, 18 million tonnes of seafood production globally to a staggering 150 million tonnes. So this upscaling of seafood production is quite staggering. And you can also see that it's not tapering off. There is no uh, levelling off in terms of our need for seafood. Most of this seafood currently has come from the oceans. And until recent times, this is where nearly all our seafood came. But to get this seafood, we've had to go deeper into the oceans and we've also had to substantially fish down food chains where we are now fishing uh, pelagic small fishes to be able to uh, acquire some of that fish protein. And unfortunately, most of our wild capture fisheries are fully fished. So about 70% of the world's fish populations that are fished are now fished at their maximum levels and we cannot push them any harder or they'll become unsustainable. 20% of fishery stocks are in collapse and we only have a buffer of 10% of which we could exploit further. And it's actually been since about 1995 since we reached this term peak fish from wild capture fisheries. And we cannot extract any more seafood from the ocean, which you would think would create quite a food security crisis if seafood was something we needed into the future. Fortunately, aquaculture as a new industry, about 40 years of age, has really grown rapidly to be able to supply that demand for seafood protein over the last 40 years. And in actual fact, it's the fastest growing food production sector and very soon it will supply 50% of global seafood production. So we're still looking okay, but up to 2050, there are certain requirements for us to actually address around aquatic food security. And for us to be secure for aquatic seafood, we have to satisfy five criteria, the five S's. We have to be able to produce sufficient seafood that meets society demands and wants. It has to be safe 
and Professor Lapata will talk a little bit about safety of seafood. It has to be sustainable. We cannot have our seafood now and not leave the opportunity for seafood to future generations because of unsustainable practices. And also, it has to, we have to have shock-proof systems. So seafood trading can actually be quite volatile. Disease can affect production dramatically and geopolitical instability may actually threaten aquatic food security. And finally, it has to be sound in that we need to have ethical and uh, legal practices that conform to society's expectations. So finally, I'm just going to introduce aquaculture. And as I see, where are the pressure points for us in aquaculture to ensure aquatic food security? First of all, we need to improve our production efficiencies. Most aquaculture in the world is actually pretty low technology. It's not based on genetically improved stocks. And so we can actually really drive production efficiencies by using smarter science. We need to deal with disease. We need to actually provide better diets, more sustainable diets, not reliant on marine sources. This is a big one, human capital. There is going to be a shortage of highly skilled aquaculture um, technicians globally very soon as we transition from a low technology industry into a high technology industry. We need robust and transparent supply chains where providence, traceability, food safety are all assured. And finally, we need to really implement biotechnology and technological innovations to drive this industry forward to ensure that it can actually provide aquatic food security into the future. So that's my quick introduction to aquatic food security. Thank you, and I'll pass you over to the next speaker. Thanks so much, <laughs> Professor Jerry. So we'll hand over to Lim Hwan Sen from ABA. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dean Jerry, for introducing the importance of aquaculture. Just let me just introduce to you about the Agri-Food and Veterinary Authority of Singapore. We are the authority, the government authority, in charge of ensuring resilient supply of safe food, safeguarding the animal and plant health, and animal welfare, and also facilitate agri-trade. I think some of you may be aware that back in July, we had this announcement, the government announced the formation of uh, step board, Singapore Food Agency, which will oversee both uh, all food, they will bring together all food uh, related resources and capabilities from both AVA, NEA, and HSA. And this will actually uh, uh, allow us to better uh, manage uh, this both food security and food safety across the whole food value chain from farm to fork. I think here I just like to say that we are uniquely Singapore. Although we are a small country, we import most of our food, more than 90% of our food. We are price takers, we have a small market, and we are susceptible to all the global food situations, including some of those that's outlined by Dean Jerry. And yet, in terms of the ranking, we rank quite high in terms of global food security, number four, and we will be at the top among the, uh, those countries in the Asia Pacific. And we recognize that while in the past, uh, food diversification, uh, getting food from various sources, diversify our sources, has served us well. We also recognize that there's a need for us to grow our local basket, local food basket, local production, and especially aquaculture. So since 2014, we have embarked on this journey, uh, uh, productivity drive to transform our local food agri, uh, agri food sector. And that we did, we launched a 63 million agriculture uh, productivity fund, and it comprises of various schemes, basic capability upgrading schemes, uh, productivity enhancement, and also R&D, so that our farmers can uh, apply for these schemes uh, and to fund their research, to fund their uh, up upgrading of the capabilities, and also productivity enhancements. And in 2017, our senior minister of state, Mr. Ko launched the farm transformation map uh, outlining the various strategies and trusts to transform our local uh, uh, farm uh, sector into one that is uh, um, productive, one that's uh, innovative, and one that's sustainable. I think it's, it's 
out there. I think and, and some of these initiatives are outlined there, including consulting the industry, co-creating solutions. I think this has led to the formation of the uh, uh, Singapore, Singapore Agro Food Enterprise uh, Federation or SAFER uh, uh, last year and banding together quite a number of uh, the local farms together to see how it could improve the agriculture sector. And also, and a part of this initiative, we also tender out land uh, starting from uh, August last year on, on, uh, on, the co on the concept and price. It means a fixed price so that you invest technology. You don't have to guess the price, you don't, but you will uh, invest more uh, technology, devote all, more of these resources on the concept, coming out with innovative concepts. Right? And I think if you are, some of you may be aware, that I think we are also uh, looking at promoting local produce through collaboration with the industry and retailers. I think some of you must have seen this, some of this. Singapore uh, SG uh, Farmers Market loves uh, love, uh, homegrown produce. I think some of you are involved, I think, among this audience, involved in some of these uh, fairs, weekend markets to promote the greater awareness of our local produce. Uh, in Singapore. Okay, I think just like to share that indeed some of our efforts have started to show and so to uh, show that you see our farms, previous, if you look at it from the open net cage farms, we are looking to move to somewhere to adopt technology into something that's called floating coast containment systems that's on uh, on your right, right? Those uh, floating coast containment system. From the land based farms, we have, we have also now going up to uh, into uh, area systems that are vertical. Uh, they are also like Paramani uh, Asia uh, farming out, uh, utilizing the ocean, the, the, the sea, right? from the coastal, more shallow waters to the deeper waters. So we are looking at getting, encouraging our farms to uh, go indoor, to go vertical, or to go further out. Right? So, so hoping to leverage on technology uh, to thrive this transformation of local farm sector. And, and I think this is ably supported by the research and eco, uh, education ecosystem. And some of, this, some of those courses that's highlighted up those, they just come on stream uh, in the recent years. I think one of them is James Cook University, actually on aquaculture. So I think I can see from here. And, and some of the diploma courses on aquaculture also come about in the recent years. Uh, and if you look at it, we also, for the AVA, we have our Marine Aquaculture Center on St. John's Island. And here, I think um, he, he was built, he was to spearhead the tropical aquaculture development and some of our key R&D initiative include, include uh, selective breeding, large scale fry production technology, uh, development of new species, and also development of aquaculture systems. And here, I think we, we warmly welcome all of you, uh, those who want to uh, 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 work with us to conduct some of the R&D at uh, MSC, I think we also work quite closely with James Cook University to do some of this research work at our centre. Yeah. Okay, I think I'll just leave you with this quote and uh, that's it, that's my introduction. Thank, thank you. Okay, um, thank you for those two presentations. In some ways, I'm going to be backing some of that up. Uh, I'd also say that the Singapore... It, what you see in Singapore is at the top end of the industry that I've looked at uh, in the past. Um, this is actually a big topic, and uh, what I'm going to do is just make a few quick comments. Um, I have a focus on, on the finfish industry, and on the whole industry, and also on, on, on what's going on in ASEAN. So, um, as uh, was said earlier, Singapore actually is number four in terms of global position in the food security uh, index. Um, however, our other nations in the region are in a completely different situation. So we've got, um, we've got situations where uh, there is food insecurity in an environment where the market is growing, and as was said earlier, higher income groups, uh, higher incomes, our economic growth is fast, so we've got a situation where there's a shift out of carbohydrates uh, into into uh, proteins, um, and this, so this is this is quite a serious issue. Uh, the main thing here is this is the opportunity for businesses in the region. 
Um, however, we've got some issues in terms of things that we have to think about um, because this is a highly segmented market. Um, and I said earlier on, I'm not actually thinking about talking about shrimps. I'm talking about fin fish. Shrimps generally are a premium product. Uh, fin fish, we can start at the bottom with staple type fish and move up to groupers. And so there's a whole mix in, in, in inside this. But the basic opportunity is in all of these countries in the region. Um, as was said earlier, we have some huge problems in terms of wild capture fish stocks. Um, this information came from a study which was done by APFIC in 2014. Um, and they've not actually done a study more recently. There, there have some, been some survey ships going around the region, but uh, I'm not seeing any information come out on it. So what we've got is a situation where the black marks are, um, the black crosses are, is basically where we've got coastal fisheries uh, production in decline or flat um, and as was said the pelagic species has basically disappeared so what you've got is is small holder or small scale fishers who cannot produce products because there's nothing in the seas in those areas um, there is as I, I would say is there is a lot of uncertainty over how much fish is in the sea at the moment uh, because nobody really is doing a, a proper job in terms of surveys um, so, staple fish is badly, badly affected because there's overfishing going on all around the region. Um, the biggest issue really with this fully fished and overfished actually is, is the fact that we've got a very large area in the South China Sea, but there's also a huge question mark over what's going on in the middle, you know, with, with China's interactions over the islands and things like that. And clearly they, they, they want the resources and that actually includes fish. So generally, um, the, the FAO is not positive about these, these situations. And at a business level, you know, I'm talking about uh, small-scale fishers, that it's a bit of a disaster um, because it's impacting quite negatively on, on coastal communities. Um, save the wild capture. I, I, when I came to the end of two years' work, I said that's basically what we've got to do. Um, however, when you start to look at saving the wild capture, and this is North Sea herring, um, that fish, they basically banned fisheries uh, from, from taking for, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so. And uh, it, it did bounce back. Um, it was a very strong political support for that. Um, but what happened in the end with it is they're now producing it. And I remember this when I was a child, but people don't eat it now because they don't remember the fish. So it's, it's a rather strange situation. So what is the fish? So the thing is that there has to be a political uh, motivation. They have to be able to do things to actually change, change the, the scenario over wild capture fisheries. And in this region, it is very, very difficult. Um, main reason is in some countries in the region, uh, the, 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 the fish stocks on the coastal, in the coastal areas are basically deemed for people who live on the coastal areas. So it's very difficult for a government to turn around and put a ban in. And it, I, I believe, based on what I've seen and what I've heard, is it's almost impossible for that to be done. So the point about aquaculture then becomes even more important than with that situation. What do we do? I, I just want to throw in here fish or chicken. Um, these are the two most efficient um, things to produce. Um, what I would say is, it's very difficult for anybody in this region to produce beef, goats, because they're big animals, they need a lot of feed, they need water. And pigs is not actually a very good thing because you've got a lot of halal uh, demand in, in, in places like Indonesia and Malaysia. So that one, next one. So do we go, which, which direction do we go? Do we go down the route of uh, small, small scale cages all over a lake like that, which you can actually walk across? Or do you go into and invest in these in the, in the um, cages as as they are on the other side, which is sort of in the Mediterranean? Uh, generally, governments seem to think it's better, it's easy to throw fish in a pond and they will grow, which uh, is a huge problem. This is the problem. Um, a lot of governments are focused on farming, and they you know in in chicken there's a biosecurity box, so you don't get avian flu inside. But in the in the um, aquaculture area, things flow from the wild into, into cages. Generally, when it gets pushed, then you get this uh, production to destruction cycle. 
So there is a lot of subsidies being pushed behind uh, growing fish in aquaculture, and then you get a wild, ca a, a wild, um, you get a disease in it, it causes a collapse. And finally, if uh, if you're attempting to develop a good base for policy on aquaculture, it is very complicated. And I don't really want to go into this, but this is broadly the things that people don't start to look at. So that's about my, yeah, that's the end of my five minutes. Sorry about that. Hi, um, Shaw from Responsible Seafood. Um, so very quickly, just a background. Um, what started out as a consultancy company for us, and now we have evolved into a supply branding entity. Uh, there are certainly motivators and drivers that resulted in our business model evolution. Uh, personally, for me, I was a marine biologist. Uh, I received my education in, um, in Australia, and I was fortunate enough to travel the world and to see and experience different regions. Uh, doing distinctively different forms of aquaculture, captive base grow out, and also wild harvest. And also, I was able to feel and understand the communities were the backbones behind such operations. And finally, uh, with Responsible Seafood, we are able to share our stories and the produce with our wow. end users' customers. And um, so, this is just a very generic picture, but I guess we all can see the drift behind this. So, looking at this picture, it's easy to uh, play spot the difference. Um, big fish, reasonably sized man on the left. And over the course of time, the results inverted. And now we have small fish, um, still reasonably sized man, only by modern day standards. And uh, no seabirds that's perched on the side of the um, walkway. So what's the hidden history lesson in all of this? Um, action equal reaction. We are what our experiences make us up to be, all these cliches, but in all truthfulness, our current state of seafood with its indirect and direct consequences is just an accumulation of our past actions. Um, coupled with improved technological advances, excessive mechanization, finite resources, overexploitation of resources, mismanagement of practices, the list goes on. Um, our landscape is a constant state of dynamic equilibrium. Um, businesses and us as humans are barely in line with this natural order of things. Uh, nowadays, the key words revolving around innovators and entrepreneurs is um, the word disruptors. It's an interesting food for thought though. Uh, it is necessary and quintessential for modern day businesses to disrupt conven conventional practices to keep up with um, the current social economical needs of the global market. Disruption, however, is a double-edged sword and um, we can disrupt in a positive manner, bring forth a more sustainable future and this is where um, everyone here steps in. Uh, so just very quickly, there's two types of seafood production. Uh, the wild caught. Uh, wild caught can be trawling, dredging, um, and it, it runs from uh, a full range of mechanism. Um, nowadays, there's just so many boats available um, uh, just because of what we can do with technology. Put it this way, you can buy a fishing trawler off China for less than a million dollars these days because there's just so many fishing trawlers being produced but not enough fish around in the world. The next thing, of course, we have is uh, farm seafood, which I believe um, a lot of my co-panelists have touched on. Uh, aquaculture is, of course, the next big thing. It's feeding the world's population. Uh, there, there's a whole suite of aquaculture activity that goes on, be it vertical, be it uh, RAS system, captive uh, base grow out. Um, it could even be a polyculture system, so there's a lot where the human ingenuity can come in to assist with aquaculture. So what is sustainability and, and how does it work? Um, at Responsible Seafood, we do believe that it takes a lot of hard work, uh, greed and sort of unwavering fortitude to build a business based on, uh, that revolves around sustainability. However, to shape and influence and make a significant impact born of a vision will take a collective effort from across the matrix of policy makers, business operators, and end user consumers. Uh, succession planning, as uh, Tony has mentioned earlier on, is always a tedious task, but it's necessary, crucial. Um, it is important to fix our current situation before it goes catastrophically wrong. You know, um, as what they always say, you will only fix your roof 
when the sun is out. You don't fix your roof when it's raining. So this is a time for us to act. Um, so everyone that's sitting here today, we have a part to play. Food security and sustainability goes hand in hand. It's about allowing us to live our life as fully as we can without having to sacrifice the ability of future generation to meet theirs. Sustainability caught and responsibly farmed seafood can and will minimize environmental impacts, promote economic and social growth, in the full understanding that product safety remains key in all our consideration. As business operators and consumers set, set in the world of today's modern days capitalism, it is possible to use our money wisely to change the behavior to allow us to be more sustainable. As mentioned earlier, when we were a consultancy outfit, we wanted to influence others to make the change, which led to a lot of talk with little or no execution. Hence, instead of us being the influencer, we decided to take on the roles and responsibility of the change maker by physically doing it ourselves to cater to our customers' needs. Seafood security and sustainability issues are trans-border. The justification of engaging business and consumers, in my opinion, are, not, are necessary for such changes because it's about crossing borders to have dealings. Likewise, for NGOs and humanitarian organizations, because it is through them that we see the world in terms of what we can do across our borders to help the farmers whose produce we cherish so much. Um, pretty much it is a trickle-down effect from policymakers, business leaders, and also a derivation of change arising and massing from the consumers. So very quickly, there are um, a whole suite of NGOs out there, eco-labels that we can actually use or uh, encourage their use. Um, you know, there's, high, uh, there's a mark of endorsement, environmental qualities that's out there. Um, the consumers just need to be made aware of what's available. And given the age of information and connectivity that we are in these days, it's not hard to choose from one of this range of um, eco labels out there. Uh, namely, you have MSC, ASC, uh, Friends of the Sea, BAP, Global Gap. So the list goes on. Choose wisely. Um, and you know, um, the main motivators would be, of course, economical, environmental, ethical. And uh, we are here today for where we are going to be tomorrow. Thank you. OK, very quickly, we are from uh, Commonwealth Capital, but one of the investy companies is uh, Baramundi Asia. And this is really uh, trying to address the seafood security topic over here through our lenses. Um, a lot of panelists have covered some of these points. I'm going to really run through very quickly. When we invested in this business, there are three mega trends we're looking out for. One, global growth, right, in terms of population. So it's going to be a bigger pie. Second point, already covered, uh, there's also a growing middle class, which means that the rise of proteins uh, versus just carbs will continue. We also looked at the different classes of proteins. That's the mega trend number two. We need to be sustainable, as was uh, highlighted by quite a few of my uh, noted panelists. If you look at these, these are what we term as feed conversion ratios, basically the amount of input and what comes out in terms of output. And if you look at this very uh, quick uh, picture, uh, chicken and fish, as was mentioned, uh, is actually quite good. Thirdly, this slide uh, captures some of the earlier points made as well. I'm not going to uh, belabel all this, but maybe just to look at the second uh, table over here. And it says that sometime in 2013, some of the other published uh, papers say it's 2014, but sometime in 2013 or 2014 thereabouts, uh, aquaculture overtook wild-caught fish. Okay, the production of which. So you're actually now seeing that we are consuming more farm fish uh, than wild caught. What all this translates into, uh, it means for us as a commercial entity, uh, an opportunity to make one of the fin fish, white fish, that is from a tropical area, because this is where we are at, um, to potentially become a white salmon. Now I'm going to show you a video um, so that we kind of break the monotony. This is uh, one of the farms in, in Australia, uh, and it happens to be the one that we, we uh, have invested in, and we uh, did this only in July of this year. So this is as, as fresh as it gets, and it's going to be a good plug for Australia because uh, this farm is found in Broome, 
uh, it's about 2,400 kilometers north of Perth. It's in WA, but it's quite a distance up there. So you need to hug the equator in general. It's a tropical fish, so the closer you are to warmer waters uniformly throughout the whole year, the better in terms of farming productivity. If I can just uh, request for Jennifer to kick, uh, start the video. Well, Australia is the home of the barramundi. It's the national fish of Australia. Barramundi means big scaled fish in the Aboriginal language. It is quintessential Australian. We are here in Australia in the Coolbarra farm. It is the only farm in Australia that grows barramundi in the seawater in big nets. Coolbarra wants to be the world's best producer of sustainably farmed barramundi. It's very important to produce sustainably because at this moment in time in our planet, we are with so many people that we are already seriously affecting the environment that we live in. And of course, there are more people coming who need to eat. So we should produce the protein in a way that is uh, sustainable. We can produce the same amount and better. The Kimberleys is one of the very few unspoiled areas in the world. And that is why it's such a special place. The Aboriginal people with the ranger programs keep it clean and pristine. We are very, very fortunate to be able to grow barramundi here in its natural habitat. Uh, that we, we have. There's an, uh, another site, obviously, in Singapore. That's how we started. It's in the south, uh, southern islands uh, towards the Raffles Lighthouse and Pulau Samakau. And I will give you another clip later which will allow you to see what's going on over there. But I think one of our panelists touched on the importance uh, of managing diseases. Uh, if you look at farming, it's all about disease and disasters and mitigating those risks. And for us, uh, that's something that we want to do preemptively. So we do have a autogenous uh, vaccines program. And uh, the, pictured, uh, pic the person pictured here is uh, Dr. Marcus. Uh, he's an Austrian. But you can see him trying to dissect uh, uh, a fish over there. So we dive into the every single cage every day to check on the health of a fish. Uh, and that's quite a number of cages. Uh, but that's the amount of care that we, we, uh, we perform. Actually, in, in, in the midst, I'm not going to make her embarrassed, but we also have uh, our uh, health, fish health uh, person uh, from our farm over here, and, and she's very, very actively uh, managing all these things. Now, I think I cannot overstate the importance of this uh, as opposed to using antibiotics, which is really a, uh, a little bit of a, of a dirty word. Um, and I think this is the direction that we need to take to develop vaccines to improve the immunity uh, of the fish itself. Now I've got one last video, um, and this is uh, really to explain the importance of us being able to deliver the fish uh, in an unbroken cold chain from the farm direct to fork.
Okay, that's my last slide. Um, so this is our response to the uh, food security issues that Singapore faces and uh, our hopefully our little contribution towards uh, addressing that issue. We today combined would have about 4,000 tonnes uh, of barramundi produced every year. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Now we're going to hand over to Andrea Zapata from uh, Australia via Zoom. Let's get started. So I'll just give you, just brief you my background. So I work on seafood and seafood and the health for, of humans since the last 25 years. And I'm particularly interested of the positive health, health effects of consumers of seafood, but also uh, workers and consumers of the end product. So what you see on the next slide, i give you a brief overview uh, that food allergy is one of the uh, adverse reactions we see to seafood, but luckily there's only a very small portion of the population, probably around 1%, actually has a true food allergy to seafood. The vast majority of people, if they have uh, adverse reactions, are actually food intolerance or toxins generated by a variety of different components. On the next slide, I actually show you the different components which can cause adverse reactions, and that's what we and colleagues of us worldwide investigating. On the left side, you see the allergens, the fish, the, our lobsters and abalones. All of these guys, unfortunately, can cause allergic reactions, but again, this is a very, very small proportion of uh, consumers worldwide. And this is really dependent actually on the consumers themselves, on the immune system of these people, not on the seafood. All seafoods are the same when it comes to consumption. However, when you see there are a few uh, highlights of contaminants which can cause adverse reactions in consumers. On the top left, I show you histamine. That's one of the products you found mostly in fish, not in shellfish. And this is caused by improper handling. If the cold chain is broken, if Food, seafood gets warm, it produces histamine, and this substance causes allergy-like symptoms. So this is something after you catch the seafood, after you have produced nicely at the retailer, it can actually cause these kind of symptoms. Then you have on the bottom this little worm, parasites. And you heard earlier on some talks about biosecurity. Parasites are actually quite found in uh, commonly in wild caught uh, seafood products and sometimes occasionally actually can also affect humans. So knowledge about these parasites and testing for these parasites increases actually uh, uh, safety and security of consumers. And last but not least, of course, marine biotoxins on the right side, uh, probably causing the, the biggest problems with seafood occasionally. In the top middle, you see consumers sitting around the table. You know, when you order your seafood, what you have seen in the last video is really fantastic and amazing, uh, really traceability of the seafood from the farm to the fork. But on the left side, you see workers sorting out fish. What you heard from Professor Jerry and other presenters, there's an increasing amount of seafood produced, and of course also workers handling seafood and manufacturing uh, uh, food are increasing these numbers of workers. But the current we know at least 40 million people are worldwide involved in some uh, way of handling seafood, right from the production, uh, from the catching seafood, aquaculture, where seafood is bred in aquaculture, and then of course, finally processing. So 40 million currently, and this number will probably in the next 30 to 40 years double. So also we're looking at these people that they are <coughs> safe and secure, produce uh, safe food products. So marine biotoxin, coming back to this on the right side, the abalone shell, marine biotoxins, what you can see in the next slide, that actually occurs very frequently in warmer tropical waters. <clears throat> and if you catch seafood in the, on the shores or wild seafood, you are, of course, or the seafood is exposed to these toxins. And indirectly, also consumers can be affected uh, consuming these toxins in seafood. And in the next slide, <clears throat> you see viruses. Also, viruses can be found in various seafoods, but all of these contaminants are much more frequent 
<clears throat> in seafood which is caught in the wild and not harvested in aquaculture. Harvesting aquaculture, you're very much under control of all contaminants starting from parasites to viruses and other potential contaminants. So when you see on the last slide, it's the different activities we do at JCU, at James Cook University to help the production of secure food and indirectly, of course, of safe food. And we help diagnosing consumers if they actually had an adverse reaction to contaminant rather than a proper allergy. We develop and improve detection assays which help farmers producing safe and secure seafood. And we're helping also looking at detecting environmental contaminants, which are also for workers and producers and retailers of seafood could be a potential problem. But last but not least, public awareness, I think it's very, very important. And education and training of people uh, being able to identify and distinguish if something is a real true allergy, which is actually very rare, or if it's some kind of other contaminants, which can be regulated uh, on the production line. So that's basically in a nutshell what we are doing, and I hope this uh, we can discuss it further in the next few minutes. Thank you. majority of cultured fish are for the premium markets. So how are we to utilize aquaculture to provide food security to those in uh, lower socioeconomic areas? Uh, aquaculture is not exactly something that is risk free, as we all know. In fact, uh, it's quite a risky business. It's about managing disease and disasters, as we, we uh, mentioned earlier. So I think the first principle is that we need to make sure that the initial uh, first fruits, as it were, from such investments has to make sure that the business is sustainable. If it loses money uh, repeatedly for a sustained period of time, then all that effort would go down the tubes. So as a general principle for those who are in, in marketing or taking courses in marketing, um, there's, a, there's a thing called the, um, it's a terrible name, but the price skimming strategy, uh, whereby you go after uh, the market for the early adopters who are willing to pay a little bit more premium uh, for a better product, a higher premium product. And as the production increases and the risk increases, uh, that would allow actually for democratization of that product uh, to be accessible, to be affordable to the rest of the global community. You see that in contact lenses. Uh, the first set of contact lenses actually cost only about a dollar to make, and this is way back in the uh, 80s. Remember this in my university days? We did a case study on that, Bosch and Loan. And then you find that over time, uh, because of the fact that the uh, production increased, uh, greater adoption uh, had taken place, uh, the cost of production goes down. And then suddenly you see more and more consumers being able to afford it because the prices have actually uh, come down. So hopefully we do the same for um, aquaculture. Uh, salmon right now is widely available. It's uh, ubiquitous, uh, and I hope the other uh, farm fish will one day uh, do the same as well. Thanks. I think um, Professor Jerry also wants to add a comment. I just want to, I just want to add the comment that actually uh, the world fish supply from aquaculture is primarily low uh, value product. So 18 million tonnes of carp are produced annually. Uh, the next most cultured species is tilapia, um, around uh, I think about 5 million. And then uh, catfish, and it's not till you get start to get down the species list to seven, and, and barramundi uh, globally about 75,000 tonnes. So it's still got a long way to go to, um, you know, to be considered as a, I volume, I premium fish. I'm sure Andrew and others are working hard to do, to get it there. Anyway. I want to ask one, Andreas, do you eat seafood? <laughs> yes, I love seafood. I love seafood. I have a group, I have a group of 10 foods. We have once a week, we have a barbecue where we have a Monday and Thursday. And what like? 
Sounds great. So would you say if we are looking to increase aquaculture production to address uh, our seafood security issues, uh, are we putting ourselves at a bigger risk of allergens or issues in seafood or uh, will it be safer? Hello? Uh, uh, I don't think at all that we put our at more risk because if you look at other productions of chickens, milk production of chicken, production of cattle, a lot of chemicals are used, a lot of medications too, also there. So it's not uncommon in animal production that you have to work and do this other problem. However, I think there might be an increase in the commercial activity in the where farmers don't have direct input. input. And the once the is the farm, and it goes to the retail business and it comes to the uh, plate of the consumers, there are a lot of potential risk involved, which means the farmers are not really uh, uh, able to manipulate them. It's all of their hands. But I would not see it as the same increase, but of course, if you double the amount of consumers in the people, I think it does surprise the future's the uh, number of people uh, potentially have some adverse reaction. Thanks, Andreas. So, uh, the next question I'm going to ask is about some of the higher technology things that are happening in Singapore. So, this one would be for Juan Sen. With the limitations of coastal farms, would vertical aquaculture be an economical and viable farming method to produce fish to bolster Singapore's food security? Maybe a second, I think we have addressed from the point that uh, whatever technology, it has to be, it has to make sense without of cost structure, right? I think uh, you can have the best technology and it's just not cost, you can't sustain a business, then it does not, it will not, make, it will not be sustainable in the long run. Right? I think increasingly as we shared by the panel, there are more and more this growing awareness in the of the sources food, whether it's sustainable farm, whether we use antibiotics, uh, are these practices sustainable, whether it even in terms of feeds. So I look at it here, yes, I think while we acknowledge, I think here is that if we can come a very innovative way to make more productive use of our land by going vertical, yes, I think it's possible. But like I say, we have to look at innovative technologies that, that can significantly be used Cost, operating cost. I think we recognize that any RAS system, one of the key concerns is cost. Right? Whether uh, can use actually versus the coastal farm, right? Versus the coastal farm. But I think what what one other factor that we probably need to look at is the scale of operation. And a lot of times, cost is very high because of the scale of operation. Coastal farm, a lot of them might be there if they are very small scale and then you don't really need to spend Thank you. So there was another related question, which is really about with that kind of technology, the high, the vertical farming, will the large energy consumption contribute itself to climate change in the long run? And so are the current systems that we operate in aquaculture, are they consuming a lot of energy? It depends on what type of aquaculture. So aquaculture comes in many different forms from very low input, extensive systems, through the super intensive recirculation systems where, for instance, in some shrimp aquaculture systems now in Vietnam, they can push out tonnages of uh, you know, 100, 100 odd tonnes per hectare. In Pangasius catfish culture in Vietnam, they can push out 800 tonnes per hectare with only aeration. And so it really does depend on the, on the production system, the energy. I think we have quite time for one more question tonight, which I want all of our panelists to answer. So uh, I might get Andreas to answer it first, and then we'll pass to the others. So how can Singapore and Australia work together to improve seafood security in the region? Andreas, do you want to have a go at this? Acknowledge, acknowledge the have of seafood and good health. I think we are in an excellent position that we can help and work together with seafood producers to produce uh, not only uh, healthy food, but also safe seafood. 
and this will allow limitably for you to be digital in the future. Um, just this week, I had uh, the pleasure of uh, receiving some Australian uh, business people and also uh, uh, government officials. Uh, yeah, from the uh, CRCNA, it's basically a uh, coordinated research center for Northern Australia. Uh, and I think it's a recognition on both sides, uh, in Singapore as well as in Australia, that it's great potential synergies. Uh, Australia offers vast land, great coastlines, uh, uh, very pristine waters, and I think Singapore provides a little bit of a connectivity uh, to the rest of um, Southeast Asia. So I think there's potential here to marry the two strengths. Uh, and hopefully uh, the countries, uh, I think that not too long ago there was a strategic partnership agreement that was signed as well a couple of years ago, uh, where hopefully we can transform the relationship that's really very close uh, from one of the friends, uh, hopefully to the family. I think the business community has some opportunities to be able to uh, hopefully translate that into reality. So I, I would encourage, I think, uh, more uh, interactions between the business community, the government uh, bodies as well, to uh, have a purposeful and concerted effort to see and address maybe some of the challenges uh, so that we can uh, create a highway uh, for uh, products from Australia and from Singapore uh, to market it, consume uh, in a responsible fashion, uh, hopefully in the coming years. Um, I agree with Andrew, I think uh, he made a lot of good points. Um, a lot of seafood produced in Australia is considered um, the world's best, and Australia is the top 10 producer exporter of seafood anywhere. If you look at it, Southeast Asia is the same too. Um, Southeast Asia produce a lot of the world's global trade for seafood. Um, for Singapore, we have you know, JSU on board and a lot of uh, APA, um, all this university on board. With the right manpower, we should be able to have the expertise um, to create a pool of resource to draw from, human resource to draw from. Australia with a nice coastline um, and, and very well managed um, uh, uh, fisheries we should be able to put two and two together to get more species out there. And um, the Australia-Asia region is going to be one of the biggest exporters anywhere in the world. Um, I think there's definitely a lot of rooms and uh, a lot of corridors that we can uh, work together on to actually develop this. Yeah, I, I have a different take. Um, I agree with both of those, actually. Um, I think, you know, ASEAN is actually the world's biggest producer of agriculture products. Um, but when you look beneath the surface as to what is actually going on, it's being pushed aggressively. And there is a, a massive weakness at the level of policy and regulatory framework. Um, I think that um, Australia, with its, uh, with its, with its structured um, industry regulatory frameworks and Modern, modern um, <coughs> policies towards uh, any any actual uh, animal production, livestock production, and also with uh, Singapore sat here with a similar sort of uh, viewpoint. I, I think that one one area that really does need to be worked on is actually education and training in terms of uh, working with um, government officials to actually upgrade and understand what type of regulatory framework needs to be going forward because. You know, as it's been said, we have a massive demand for seafood coming. And this thing about production to destruction cycles exists and it undermines investments. Uh, it undermines investments by small fishers, uh, sorry, smallholder farms, smallholder agriculture farms, through to big farms. So I, I would say that's basically where the focus should be. Well, uh, I think as Chef uh, Andrew, I think, yes, I think we, we see in Singapore and, and Australia uh, have very close ties and very close. And then it is so evident in, in, in MAC and JCU working together, actually in the area of And we see a lot of potential, both coming together. And then, in fact, 
um, we appreciate the expertise that the JCU brought about in agriculture, and we ourselves also, I think, from MAC, I think our team has also worked and uh, also collaborating quite closely on looking at a very number of aspects of agriculture. And here, just from that aspect, and from that angle, I think we see a lot of opportunities for us to work on, <coughs> on improving the agriculture practices, on developing some of the technologies, best practices, and uh, I think. Um, and I foresee, and I see that, yeah, we are going to work a lot more closer uh, in, the, in the coming months and years. Yes, I totally agree with all our speakers. I've got nothing else to add. But as a good academic, as I tell my students, a good communication, you top and tail it. So we need good science between Australia and Singapore. We are a knowledge-generating set of countries. And uh, that's where we really can add significant value to not only aquaculture production in Singapore and in Australia, but actually around the globe. And to ensure global food security and that increased continued demand for seafood, good science is what's needed, and that results in good business. Isn't that right, Deputy High Commissioner? Very nice. Well done. OK, so I want to finish with a quick poll of the audience. I'm going to ask you three questions and just give me a show of hands. Who ate fish this evening from the buffet outside? Who would still select fish from the buffet outside if you were offered it now that you've heard all our speakers? About the same. Great. Who is worried about your grandchildren being able to get fish from the buffet? I think we have all come away with some good messages and we all know that there is something that we can personally do to share what we understand about seafood security with our friends, with our family, with the decisions that we're making. So I really thank you for your excellent questions put through, for, through Slido. I would really encourage you to please go to our evaluation site uh, to uh, rate the evening and your experience. I would also encourage you if you have a question that wasn't answered tonight, to please come and talk to our panellists uh, afterwards. Uh, and I would also like to very much thank all of our speakers. Thank you for coming. Thank you for preparing, staying on time. Thank you, Andreas. And I would especially like to thank Dr. Jose Domingos, where is he? for organising this wonderful event and for facilitating all of the activities for the Good Science Equals Great Business Festival for JCU. So thank you, Jose. And, and thank you to all of the JCU team who've helped to pull this together tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.